let's talk about sustainable tourism. In an idyllic sense, one pictures smiling residents and equally happy tourists waltzing through clean streets, sharing a park bench, maybe stopping in a business that rolls out the red carpet for foreigners, but still manages to make that perfect croissant for the local and the interloper alike. In practice, behind the scenes, it is a great deal of work and a decades long journey of working with local businesses and residents, aligning civic attributes with a keen focus on managing perception, people and progress. If you wanna talk about sustainable tourism, you have to talk about Ljubljana, Slovenia winner of the EU's Capital of Smart Tourism Award in 2018. But if you want to talk about Ljubljana, well, then you have to talk to my friend Petra Stusek. Petra is the CEO of Ljubljana Tourism and also the president of the board of European Cities Marketing, one of the most progressive tourism marketing and management associations in the world, in my opinion. Petra emanates energy, intelligence, and the passion for tourism. And that's not surprising for a young girl who stated way back in primary school that, quote, I will go to school for tourism. Petra is an accomplished academic and an inspiring leader, but more than anything else, she is a passionate advocate for all the good things that tourism done well can bring to any destination, but especially to that jewel of European uniqueness, Ljubljana. If you haven't been, you need to go. Think of Prague with a touch of Paris thrown in, all built on a delightful, smaller human scale. An amazing place with an equally amazing tourism leader. Good morning, Petra. How are you? Where are you? And what's it like today? Hello, David. Uh, for me, it's actually good afternoon. And I'm sitting here in my office in the very heart of Ljubljana. And um, it's actually a really lovely, as you can see behind me, sunny uh, day. And we are just uh, heading towards the national holiday week. So we are in a specially good mood at the moment. <laughs> it's, it's great to see you. I got to ask you, we talked about this before, but you really did say back in grade school, I think you were, what, 10 years old when you decided, quote, you would go to school for tourism. Yeah, you're fairly close. I was actually really nine years old and I told my parents they didn't really believe me, and, but I did. Um, I did all my schooling, um, you know, and a few, several things uh, related to tourism, uh, secondary school, university, and also a, a master's degree. Um, everything was related to that and I still think that I chose the path that I really, really want to finish with whenever that's going to be. Sure, but it's it's totally prescient because when you were nine years old, honestly, Ljubljana was a place and it had people who came to see it. But the truth of the matter is, it really has emerged in the last 20 years as a significant tourism destination, isn't it? Yes, it has. Um, actually, when I was a kid, uh, this was even back then a capital city. Okay, it was a republic back then of Yugoslavia, but it was a capital city of Slovenia even back then. Uh, that wasn't a state, it was a republic. But it was a ghost town. During the weekends, no one was in the city center. We all went either to the coast or some other parts of Slovenia or ex Yugoslavia. Or, the point is that no one was, uh, uh, didn't really enjoy spending time in the city or let alone in the city center. Now, or in the past decade, things have completely changed. I have a lot of friends and I find myself included uh, that we say, well, it's a shame to go during the summertime to the seaside because it's also nice in the early fall or late spring, because in the summertime is so much fun in Ljubljana. I mean, you know, we uh, 13 years ago, we closed the city center for traffic, which meant that um, our bars, restaurants and so forth were able to put their gardens, uh, their, yeah, gar their tables to the gardens outside. Uh, no one was afraid of car to pass by. You could freely walk in the, in, in the uh, center um, in a fairly vast zone without uh, any car or even a bus 
to pass by. So the whole culture emerged out of that. Not only that we love to spend our free time there, but also we gained a lot of new spaces for putting the, um, the like venues, for putting the events there that either emerged from our heritage or are other ways interesting. So, you know, it ended up in a way that we just love to spend uh, our time in Ljubljana because the cafe, the bar scene, the restaurant scene is a very vivid. Uh, we all enjoy our local wine and local food, which is on a high quality, and we are aware of that. Uh, and we love to promote that because we really, really um, are confident in that uh, area. Uh, plus, um, a lot is going on all the time because in, in such a small city as Ljubljana is, like uh, uh, with surroundings uh, 320,000 uh, inhabitants, we have more than 13,000 events per year. And a lot of them are free of charge on the public area. So it's always something going on. Plus, we are a very outdoor nation, so we love to be outdoor, even, even if it's winter. So <laughs> it, is an, it is an amazing place. And I, I think I got there in 2017. Um, there's a river runs through the middle of town. The market's on one side of the river. The rest of downtown's on the other side of the river. The castle's across the river with the market, but up the hill. What's the, what's the river? What's the river? It's yeah. called Ljubljanica, um, and it it could be literally translated to Little Ljubljana. Uh, nice. <laughs> Ljubljanica is a very, uh, let's say, lazy river, of, uh, usually of a color green, but when it rains, it gets wild. So at that time, no um, no um, tourists or other boats are allowed to go on the river because it's too dangerous. Well, but when you're st when you're standing there in downtown and you're looking at the river and you're looking across, the market has these distinctive blue and white awnings, which are just beautiful. And, and I, I mean it with earnest when I say it's a little bit like Prague, but so much smaller scale and so much more accessible. It is... It was a jewel. It was a jewel for me because I'd never, I literally, and I, this is my own ignorance, had never heard of Ljubljana. When we learned about the former Yugoslavia, for some reason in Canada, they would leave, they would leave out Slovenia as, as one of the key aspects. So it was delightful to be there. It was a place that the people were tremendously warm. Um, they were fun. They were inviting. It was easy to get from my hotel to downtown. There were art exhibits in the square. There was a giant rattan rolling ball that was about as big as a small house in the middle of the square that people were pushing around. Very cool stuff. That's the external manifestation of a destination that's working well. But as I said in the intro, all the work that goes into aligning residents, um, businesses, city council that's an incredible amount of work you've been doing that for a decade now in a, in a few different roles talk to us about creating that alignment in ljubljana yeah uh, maybe just to to uh, stumble upon the uh, uh, um, when you made an intro and you described ljubljana just to maybe tell you how do we describe it or how do we actually see it um if you would marry Prague and Vienna and they would have a baby, the baby would be Ljubljana, but there is a plot or a twist. The mother would have to have an Italian lover. That's us. It's we love, you know, okay. Joad, Petra, you Petra, only you can get away with saying that. If I had said that, they'd have to shut the show down, you know? <laughs> But that's how it is here, you know. It's you. You find them. I mean, we are we are really a great combination of us being Slavs, Slavic nation, surrounded by a Romanic nation, Italian and Germanic nation like uh, Austria, and then Hungarians, all uh, completely different nations. So we inherited, you know, a, a, a bits and pieces of everyone, like a. Or Muzain, like a discipline from Germanic nation, but also love towards the good food, the good coffee, and the great atmosphere. Being outdoors, like you know, from uh, Romantic nations, um, and the our additional plus is that uh, we were never behind the uh, iron wall, so that means that we always were not only open. Uh, 
uh, fairly open towards uh, Western of Europe, but we um, uh, basically all of us speak English. So it's fairly easy to go by in uh, Ljubljana. But to go straight to your question, it was, it's true. There, it is a lot of work and it actually demands uh, uh, leadership which has a um, which has a courage and a vision, and that is our mayor. Our mayor is now uh, in charge for I think fourteen or fifteen years, and he started with this vision of uh, closing down the city center. Um, but that was not the that was not basically uh, that was one of the milestones. But the most important one was the leadership putting everyone together to the table. And that was for the first time in the starting with, with municipality when uh, our leaders back then, uh, the Ljubljana tourism was led by another uh, uh, director. They got to know each other within municipality for the first time, directors of public institutes or, you know, public works. So, uh, they started to talk to each other and then they started to exchange views and then they uh, started to go together to the different team buildings and uh, the, the, the whole picture finally came together where everyone, either the one who leads the public transport or us tourism or the one who's in charge for uh, the waste in the uh, policy in, in, in Ljubljana, uh, everyone, it's like uh, 60 different directors came into, built together one vision, and we are still upgrading it every year and living by it. And we know each other very well. So that's really the key, how to do it. Uh, and, and you give all sorts of people credit for that, which which is absolutely necessary. But I'm, I'm going to give you credit because when we talk sustainable tourism, um, you're not just doing it in Ljubljana and you're not just furthering and championing that stuff that, as you point out, was started before you worked on it, but you've become a champion um, at, at the European city's marketing level. You are the president and chair of the ECM board, correct? Correct. And you are a strong advocate for this idea of sustainability. And you and I have had this conversation before. When we look from North America, to um, the the adjustments we're going to make to come out of COVID to build stronger tourism destinations to create greater alignment, we often can look to ECM and the work you've done on over tourism and sustainability as a harbinger of some of the things we're going to need to do coming out of COVID-19. Let's talk for a minute about ECM and your tenure there. You've done a great job. You're a fantastic uh, uh, representative, ambassador, president. What's the focus at ECM right now? I know it, you know it, but let's share it with our with our listeners. Um, yes, the, uh, the folk, ECM is, a, is like you pointed out, and thank you for noticing that on your own. It's an association of a great, uh, you know, a, which has in common great members. Our motto is uh, that we uh, want to share, to meet when it's possible, either virtually or preferably in person. So meet to share and to grow. And the focus is on sharing. So we are... Um, we are sharing good practices, we are sharing the solutions that have been implemented or at some place but hasn't uh, at some other place. So uh, it's, it's uh, again, good thing is that even though there are, here are, we're talking about the very different nations from South of Europe to North of Europe, East, West, these really cultural differences come in place. But what we do have in common is everyone has done something really tremendous and we are we tend to share that but what we do have all in common is we are aware of the fact that uh, uh, we'll have to uh, even before the crisis we knew that we uh, need to um, focus on developing the, 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 the systems or the um, working practices sustainability-wise. I mean, in a lot of places worldwide, this was more of a buzzword because the destinations didn't implement it yet. Here it came uh, to practice uh, in, let's say, majority destinations or a, a lot of destinations already years ago and we are now just you know working further on it because the fact is 
if um, we need to make, we need to build tourism in a sustainable wa- uh, way so we can keep enjoying in general our, pla- our planet. Everyone needs to have a right to travel. That is absolute right of everyone in the planet, but we need to do it in a smart way, you know, not to, uh, not, not excessive traveling, not too many, uh, I mean, the, 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 the practices need to be built on the local heritage, uh, the zero waste programs, uh, the, um, the, 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 the sustainable practices that we actually really advanced here in Europe because we live by not only in the last uh, year or two, but uh, in a decade. I mean, uh, the let's say central western part of Europe definitely lives by this, and the northern part, the Scandinavians, are also champs in that. So we are all exchanging these practices, and um, uh, you know, not not only learning but sharing and and improving them together. Those, those practices that you've championed for pretty much a decade now, COVID has had a, a huge impact. And, and I, I dare to say, and it's a little optimistic, but a positive impact in the sense that just a minute ago, you talked about people traveling with more purpose. And unequivocally, in a world where we travel less, we will be more thoughtful about how we travel. I, I assume, but I also hope. Um, that fits really well. And I mean, you've heard a lot of, um, you actually, you've been at the center of a lot of discussion over the past year. Um, for example, uh, my friend Eric Reguli from the Globe wrote about Venice for Venetians. And, and it wasn't until we had an empty Venice that Venetians really started to wonder what it was they were, they were championing when they couldn't you know, live in their own city. So you've had discussions like that over the last year. COVID has had some positive effects in the fact that it's brought to the forefront the necessity for tourism to serve the local constituency, for tourism to enrich the life of residents. That's something you've been a champion of in Ljubljana all the way along. When you look at that shift, what other things has COVID done that's really um, accelerated some of those practices? I mean, it shifted us from from conventional marketing to digital marketing. Uh, I think you and I had this discussion and I, and I had it with some of my peers last week, you know, in a world where you can't trust always on marketing because you're under directives from government to shut down, open up, we've become a lot more agile in our marketing, which means we've actually become more digital with our marketing as well. What else do you see in the COVID crisis that's come to the forefront? Yes. COVID is a dreadful uh, um, abruption. That's, no doubt about it. But uh, like you pointed out, we, I mean, the digitalization overnight, actually everyone adopted it. And come on, let's, let's just take the perks out of it because it, it, it gives you also a lot of uh, freedom and it also uh, puts, uh, it takes a lot of pressure off from the environment. Can take it uh, when we will start to travel again. It will uh, definitely, a, a lot of meetings will take place digitally, not uh, in, in person. But yeah, the, the human touch is the most important one. That will not vanish, but we will diminish it, which is not a good, uh, not a bad thing. The other thing which is, uh, uh, let's say a good thing to take out of this whole situation is that we basically we went more towards ourselves um, in, 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 in uh, tourism wise we are much more focused on our local environment uh, and uh, not to mention the locals in general I mean we are now depending on locals who are the, the only ones who are able to travel and these are two things the worst critics but also the worst ambassadors so a double let's say reason that you work even harder than you used to I mean you work harder because the scenarios are really changing fast we are facing really new situations which we are still not so familiar with so we are changing and we're making one scenario see it doesn't work and we change it but uh, you know you you have to work on locals you have to bring them in your stores you have to let them to uh, build your story which will be then of course appealing later on also to foreign tourists 
Um, on top of that comes also the ingredients for local from uh, from local environment in your food, and uh, you know uh, you 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 are changing the stories to emphasize that too. So all in all, it's all these are all sustainable steps which you can make a great storytelling of, and this is what tourism is, you know. So. So, so let me ask you that, um, you know, if you go to Helsinki, the dish that you must try is reindeer on toast. That's, that's the thing they tell you, you've got to have reindeer on toast or you haven't actually been to Helsinki. So what is the dish in Ljubljana? What is the thing that I should eat that is totally Ljubljana? Um, I'll try to literally translate. Okay. Everyone knows in Slovenia what are typical Slovene dishes, but what are typical Ljubljana dishes? Um, it, it is kind of difficult to translate because it's a slang word, but it would be um, uh, fried whistleblows. <laughs> but sure, it, sure, sure. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually uh, is a really um, um, a dish made out of the grain. It's not even meat. It was supposed to be meat. But it's a dish made up out of grain because back then, like a hundred and more years ago, people can, couldn't afford uh, meat so much. So they shaped it in like, like, I don't know, like a piece of meat and they fried it so you couldn't see what's actually in it. And they were then bragging that they're rich enough to eat meat. And uh, <laughs> Okay, so this is, this is the original Beyond Meat. That's, that's a, actually a really an original Ljubljana uh, dish because and it, the the story it brings with it is is actually a real legend. It uh, used to be like that a hundred and more years ago, and our added value was that we have a person here who actually studies that, and he's uh, very good in these old stories related to local ingredients, which you can then translate into local dishes made in a modern way. So we made the whole thing uh, out of the whole thing we made a project called taste ljubljana dishes and we actually intrigued also locals you know like i said everyone knows what are typical slovenian dishes which not origin do not originate from ljubljana so uh, you know the locals were like, hmm, so what are the lo local ljubljana dishes so yeah we put all these stories out and now i really love to say that uh, in the best restaurants the waiters know the stories behind them. That's how. Okay, you know so I I walk into a restaurant in Ljubljana and I ask for fried whistleblows. <laughs> they're gonna look at me and they're gonna go, "Well, he's either crazy or he knows Petra." Like, <laughs> would they really know what a fried whistleblow was? <laughs> could, could be like that, but the problem is that uh, it it would be hard for them to literally translate back to our slang. <laughs> so I will teach you also the Slovene words. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a deal. All right, so so talking about that, let's let's shift gears here, and 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 as we close this out, let's talk about the future of DMOs. You've spent a great deal of time crafting uh, an excellent DMO in Ljubljana, and it's never easy. There's always difficulties and problems, but I, I really admire what you've done. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of the ECM work, as you know. Let's talk about the future of DMOs. I mean, we get through this crisis. We've got 18 to 24 months just to get through it. We've got a year or two beyond that where recovery isn't international yet. What's, if you could sum it up succinctly, what's the future role and function of a DMO? What's the perfect role and function? Um, not so long ago, the DMOs, number one task was actually, you know, marketing their destinations to discover their own DNAs and market them and, you know, make it the destination appealing to guests from whatever target uh, marketing, uh, whatever markets were targeted. Uh, nowadays, these days actually came more and comes more and more into light that DMOs need to be not only catalysts for the, the whole development, but they need to uh, we have now the perfect opportunity to become the uh, 
destination concierge is in a sense that we bring everyone together and we connect different, uh, you know, either startups like in digitalization we were talking about up to local farms around our destinations, which can bring, uh, you know, from a farm to table, which can bring local ingredients to the tables of the local restaurants, bars, hotels. Into that, you can bring even the food, the healthy food into local kindergartens or schools. That's a very close connected. Um, uh, you know, like like a, make a green supply chain. You know, these are just a few examples of what you can bring to the table if you connect everyone. And that is basically a future of DMMOs to understand the politics because let's face it, without the, without the politics, you cannot really flourish because you, you need the uh, you, you need the, not only encouragement, but support on all levels. So to listen to and understand the politics, to translate that to everyone on the market who, you know, who would like things to go faster, further, and to help everyone. In, in short, DMOs need to become DMMOs and really start to manage destinations. On that management front, one of the key ingredients, especially here in North America, <clears throat> is an emphasis, an increased emphasis on stakeholder engagement. Um, you work with DMOs all over Europe and all over the world, in fact, who are at various staging uh, points when it comes to engaging stakeholders. How does a destination credibly get started? What is what is it about stakeholder engagement? We, we talk about it an awful lot, but the truth of the matter is, Petra, 20% of destinations are good stakeholder engagers. The rest are just getting started. To those that are getting started, what do you have to say? Uh, just uh, have a really, really clear vision. What do you want to accomplish at the end? When you have that, the path might, might be rocky, but you will get there. And not, not only that, first of all, you really have to know what your, what your, your destination's DNA is. You have to believe in that. You have to know uh, what you want to accomplish at the end and then bring, just have a courage to bring everyone, even if they think now differently, bring everyone to the table and just keep repeating your, you know, your goal, your story. And it's going to work. I can tell you, we are managing also, we're not only the DMO, we're also the regional destination management organization, which means that we're managing 26 municipalities. These are 26 different visions, smaller, bigger. Uh, some have uh, uh, one attribute, others have completely different ones. And you need to bring all of them to the table and you need to teach them that at one point, one will gain. At another point, some other will gain. But the uh, most important thing is that everyone sees that at the end, everyone wins. And that's, you know, just follow your path and believe in it. It's a very straightforward advice, but it's a very, the most solid one. Well, it's it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I, I hope we can have you back on. I'm I'm very eager to come back to Slovenia. You you got some. It's an amazing city, but the countryside around it is is awesome. The mountains are incredible. The the riding, the bike riding is fantastic. Um, I look forward to the day we can travel with purpose, and I will purposely travel to Ljubljana again, and and we will have fried whistling things. <laughs> <laughs> right, whistleblowers. There it is. I will remind you with pleasure. <laughs> All right. It, it's great to talk to you, Petra. Um, thanks for being here. Have a great day. Thank you. And likewise.